Hello everyone, and welcome to a special gift for all of you, the first installment of the Gehenna Bibliotheca. While many of you have enjoyed listening to the dark tales from the Alex Grimoire, we are offering those stories to you who prefer them in this audio-only format. For those long nights driving through the empty roads, or just to fill in the quiet of your room at night, so you don't have to think about that odd sound you hear coming from the dark. This first installment is the whole collection of our Christmas episodes from 2023. And with that, let's get to our first story. Sibling rivalry is something that many of us deal with growing up, but having a parent who clearly picks a side can make the whole thing a lot worse. So bad, it gets you on the naughty list, and you get a visit not from Santa, but from the Krampus, such is the case of poor Maddie. Our first story is titled A Krampus Carol, written and posted by Jake Wick. If there was anyone to be found on Santa's naughty list, it was surely Cindy's older sister, Maddie. Cindy was eight, and Maddie was three years older and had never said a nice thing to Cindy in her life or so it seemed. Cindy's my favorite. Cindy's so pretty. Cindy this, Cindy that. These were the words from Maddie's mother that rang in Maddie's head through every day of the year, but especially around Christmas time when Cindy was talking sweetly of gift giving and decorating and loving her family and friends. Cindy was sweet, but it was authentic. All she really wanted was to be loved by Maddie the way she herself loved Maddie. Since Cindy was a baby, Maddie hadn't liked her. Some of Cindy's earliest memories revolved around the constant sideways looks she would receive from Maddie. The passive aggression, the endless competitions for mom's affection, Cindy was always the one to receive it. But on certain days, she would ask her mother to pay Maddie some attention. Oh, your sister is fine. Her mother would say, Your sister gets plenty of attention. And after saying this, her mother would usually give Maddie a half-hearted pat on the head and then go right back to giving Cindy all the affection a child would ever need. It left a hollow place in Cindy, and when she tried to give Maddie the love she so desperately needed, Maddie would shun Cindy as if Cindy were a leper. Now this year, Maddie had been extra bitter. Perhaps it was the additional attention Cindy garnered for her performance in the school's Christmas play, or maybe it was the way Mom constantly bragged about Cindy's acting. She's the next Meryl Streep, I'm telling you. Cindy's mother would brag, but whatever the reason, Maddie took every chance she saw to torment her younger sister. Cindy woke up one morning with gum in her hair another day. She found that her underwear was soaked in honey. Her favorite dolls would go missing. The TV in her room which Maddie wasn't allowed to have was constantly unplugged. Yet Cindy's desire for her sister's acceptance continued through the month of December. She continued to be kind. She persisted in giving Maddie compliments when Mother did not. The gift at the top of Maddie's Christmas list was a brand new makeup kit. Cindy made sure that she would be the one to give it to her Christmas morning. Despite all this, Cindy had felt a wear and tear from all of Maddie's torments throughout the month and it all came to a breaking point on Christmas Eve. The family sat at the Christmas Eve dinner table and ate ham and mashed potatoes and Christmas cookies. Cindy's mother had been bragging shamelessly all night long about Cindy's acting. 
There was no mention of Maddie, not at any point. Maddie was stewing and Cindy could see it. At one point through all the bragging and praising and gloating, Maddie chimed in. I don't think Cindy's acting is that good. She said, matter of factly, it was thought a bomb had gone off in the room. Everyone looked at Maddie like they were unsure they'd heard correctly. It was like blasphemy. What kind of a thing is that to say? Maddie shrugged. I don't know. I just think you're exaggerating a little bit. I mean, she's decent. All of the memories of Maddie's torments began to brawl and fester in Cindy's mind. And now here was Maddie, disparaging Cindy at the dinner table in front of the entire family, in front of all of the aunts and uncles and cousins and friends. At least I'm good at something. And just like that, Maddie retracted into a pit of shame, Cindy's words ringing true and humiliating. Mother added fuel to the fire by shrugging at Maddie in a matter-of-fact manner. Your sister's got a point. Cindy felt horrible as she watched Maddie sulk and trudge off toward the bathroom like a beaten dog. Cindy hated the power she held in her hands. That night everyone hunkered down in their beds and waited for Santa to leave his gifts below the tree but Cindy had trouble sleeping. It was midnight now. Cindy rarely found herself awake at this hour, but she knew why. Cindy removed her covers and hopped out of bed and tiptoed across her room. She was careful not to wake anyone. She opened her closet and grabbed Maddie's wrapped gift. She tiptoed down the dark hallway and dragged her fingers along the wall so as not to stumble around in the dark. I'll give Maddie her gift and tell her I'm sorry and tell her I love her. Cindy thought to herself, That's what I'll do. And she'll be happy and she'll forgive me and maybe she'll even say she loves me too. When Cindy arrived outside of Maddie's door, she heard strange shuffling noises coming from inside. Perhaps Maddie was preparing another prank for Cindy, no matter. Cindy was going to walk in and give Maddie her present and try to make amends. Cindy opened the door just a crack. She was careful not to startle Maddie. It was so dark inside the room and she couldn't see a thing, but she could hear a great deal of shuffling inside the room. Cindy stared into the room for quite some time, patiently waiting for her eyes to adjust to the gloom. When her eyes adjusted, she saw an empty bed. She saw Maddie's wide open window. She saw a seven foot figure standing in the shadows. She saw the rounded cage upon its back and she saw Maddie sitting in the cage like a frightened bird. As Cindy's terrified eyes further adjusted to the dark, she saw the figure more clearly. It had a goat's head with large horns on top. Its eyes were red and impish and hostile. It wore a suit much like Santa Claus, and it even had jingling sleigh bells hanging from a few ends of the garments. Cindy stood frozen with fear as the creature glanced at her and gave her a nod and wink. The creature made its way toward the window as it did. The last Cindy saw of her sister was a look of fear and sadness and regret. And then the creature left as Cindy stood there with the present in her hands. Down the chimney he will come with his great big grin. And you'll find that even the kitties are very liable to sin. What will Krampus say when he finds everybody sinning? What will Krampus say when he hears them sin, sin, sinning?
On our second story tonight, we go to a scene that many would find nostalgic. Christmas dinner with all the extended family. The joy of seeing loved ones who you don't get to for most of the year. Even the awkward moments when family members had a little too much to drink and breaks the taboo of talking about political opinions at the table. But sometimes this warm blanket of nostalgia can really be blinding us to horror that's really around us. As with the case of our protagonist in our next story, posted by Irod to 37, our next story is called The Last Supper. There is something about Christmas time that is eerily unsettling. The joy and happiness in the air is a pleasant change of pace from the normally dreary London atmosphere, but the sugar-coated mirth that permeates the holiday field so unreal. It's as if a tiger at the circus is put into a silly little costume and we, the audience, are supposed to believe this creature enjoys jumping through hoops when we know it would rather be mauling our children. Still, beggars can't be choosers, and I enjoy that time of year, and everyone is a shade less nasty to each other. It's been a tradition for as long as I can remember, for our family to get together at my grandmother's house on Christmas Eve. As an only child, I lived for these nights which enabled me to see all my cousins and feel a little less lonely. Even now, with most of us in our twenties or thirties, I enjoy seeing my family and catching up with them. With my old pickup truck laden down with gifts, I pulled out of my apartment complex and made my way to my grandmother's turning onto her street. I saw that the majority of my family had already arrived. I let myself in through the front door and was greeted immediately by some of the younger members of the family. The innocent excitement brought a big, goofy smile to my face. They scampered out to my truck to bring the gifts in. As I said hello to the rest of my family, after an hour or so of catching up, we all congregated to pray and eat our Christmas dinner. I found myself falling victim to the sickly sweet atmosphere the winter holidays are so famous for. I was laughing heartily at jokes that wouldn't have even brought a smile to my face any other time. I listened with rapt attention as my youngest Ken told me all about what they had been learning in school, or what they had asked Santa for. This was a time of year when I stopped playing the role of a recluse, and tonight in particular I realized the need to cherish these moments. Full of delicious holiday food, we nevertheless began devouring my grandmother's homemade ice cream, cheese so dramatically presented to us. By this time of the night, the children's eyes began to grow heavy, and one by one they nodded off on the various couches and chairs assembled haphazardly. In the living room, a great uncle of mine committed one of the ultimate social fox paws and began discussing politics. The debate became rather heated, no doubt due to the upcoming elections in our area I never much cared for the realm of politics, and in an effort to escape the growing awkwardness, I excused myself to use the restroom. I began walking back through the familiar hallway that led from the living room to the bedrooms. My grandmother was a very religious woman, and her house reflected that perfectly. Everywhere you looked, your eyes would find crucifixes, angels, and Bibles. I myself believed in God, but did not worship with the fervor that my grandmother did. Lining the walls were pictures from a forgotten time, 
interspersed with paintings depicting various biblical scenes. A cross hung above the entrance to each bedroom, the beds looking immaculately clean as they waited for someone to make use of them. At the end of the hallway was a large mirror, which hid the door to the only restroom in the house. I smiled as I recalled how my cousins and I would sprint down the hallway towards the glass, amused by our reflected selves perched above the mirror was my grandmother's most prized possession. It was a beautifully rendered version of the Last Supper, but instead of the usual background, Jesus and his apostles sat amongst the clouds and angels. I had never truly looked at the painting before, so for the first time my eyes feasted on how detailed and lifelike it was. As I began to turn away to rejoin my family, I could have sworn I saw a ripple play across the face of one of the angels, fixing my attention back on the painting. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary, silently laughing at the quick twinge of alarm I had felt. I again made to walk back down the hallway only. Try as I might, my entire body was rooted to the spot. I began to panic, fearing I was having some sort of seizure. I could open my mouth, but no sound would leave it. Again, the ripple crossed the angel's face, until finally it remained there, the face turning into a bubbling mass. Slowly, the angel began to transform before me. I could not even begin to comprehend the horrific abomination it was becoming but I was fully aware of the effects it was having on my body. I could feel something dripping from my eyes. Whether it was tears or blood, I could not tell. My brain throbbed against my skull with a painful intensity, my mind threatening to explode as I neared the brink of insanity. My whole face began to tremble. I wanted nothing more than to scream for help but my body had other ideas. A fresh wave of horror washed over me as I felt my hands rise to my face completely of their own will. My fingers began scratching at my eyes, determined to rip them out. My eyes stayed open through the pain, my hands willing to do anything to make the ghastly vision in front of me go away. Anything to stop this madness my vision began to fade as my eyes gave way under the clawing. I collapsed to the ground, blind but still alive. The warmth of the blood pouring out of my eye sockets was my only comfort, and I was still unable to speak or move. Dear old grandmother would be too late in finding me as I silently bled to death in a crumpled heap on the floor. I awoke in a stark white room. It seemed I had been sleeping sitting up, and I had no knowledge of how I arrived here. As I struggled to grasp what was happening, I realized I was not alone. Five beautiful angels stood before me. Smiling as I looked at each in turn, I couldn't help but return the smile. Realizing I must have ascended to heaven, I rose from the floor and immediately began to sob as the beautiful faces were disturbed by a familiar rippling. Though when it comes to ghost stories, we always think of them around Halloween. But Christmas has a long history as well. Many of the famous ones throughout history have been told around this time of year and it would not be Christmas without one. In our next story, the memories of past Christmas have a way of staying with us. Even if the items we had were passed on to go to those more in need. Our third story is called The Carolers, and it was written and posted by Mac Ralston. The following is a written 
account of the oral tradition of the Carolers phenomena. There is no known region or time frame of origin in regard to this tradition. Rather, this written account will pull folklore, urban myth, and eyewitness accounts from a variety of places and times. The Carolers, sometimes referred to as the Wassailers, is a phenomenon that occurs predominantly during the month of December. However, some reports suggest that occurrences in late November and early January have also been recorded. The phenomenon appears to be supernatural in origin, and there appears to be no certain way to trigger the occurrence, however. Every witness to the apparition or apparitions has had one crucial similarity. All of those who had been visited by the carolers had recently donated clothing to a local charity or drive with only minor exceptions. Given the seasonal timing of the occurrence, the clothing in question is often wintertime outerwear, including, but not limited, to jackets coats, sweaters, vests, mittens, gloves, scarves, beanies, bonnets, earmuffs, snow boots, and other assorted cold weather attire. Additionally, it should be noted that, while every eyewitness of the phenomenon had recently donated such apparel, not every donor was visited by the apparition or apparitions though it is still unsure as to why this is the case. According to varying legends and the mouths of those who had allegedly seen the carolers, the apparition would appear some time after the donation had taken place, always at night and on nights where the temperature was considerably low, often snowing and, in some instances, below zero, while the timing of the appearances would vary from location to location, many Carolers sightings would occur during the middle of the night, around midnight to three in the morning. Eyewitnesses would describe hearing a faint, nearly inaudible sound upon waking from their slumbers. After some moments would pass, this sound would rise considerably in volume and become intelligible, though muffled as described. The growing sound was that of either a voice or several, depending on the quantity of clothing articles donated prior. The voices were often described as angelic or otherworldly, and would reportedly be heard singing Christmas carols from outside the home. Hence, the phenomenon is referred to as the carolers, as such, the following list catalogs every known song reportedly sung by the apparition. Although the catalog is incomplete and constantly being updated as new sightings occur and new song books, music sheets are discovered. Here we come a crawling, silent night, good King Wenceslas, Addist Fidelis, it came upon a midnight clear, tied rest ye merry gentlemen. Angels we have heard on high, Coventry Carol, ye three kings, in the bleak midwinter, and the little drummer boy. Upon hearing any of these carols, many of those who encountered the phenomenon would follow the sound to its point of origin, typically outside the home's front door where the witness in question would see what appeared to be the clothing that they had donated. Prior, suspended in the air and seemingly worn by invisible persons, with the sound emanating from where a mouth should be, often beneath a beanie or somewhere within a hooded coat. Upon the completion of the carol, these garments would then drop to the ground, and the phenomenon would end with the exception of a large family of eight from Nebraska. Most sightings of the apparition consisted of anywhere from one to six carolers outside the front door, with the average being three. 
due to the nature of typical clothing donations and drives, the outfits worn by the apparition are often incomplete, with some being mere scarves for feet off the ground, to others being fully bundled with the exception of a face. Any and all appearances of the carolers phenomenon, despite differences in attire or the amount thereof behaved in a similar manner. The apparition would appear, sing, and depart with only a few rare exceptions that will be listed below. Mary Thomas, a 68-year-old woman from De Plains, Illinois, is the only recorded individual visited by the carolers who did not report the sighting herself. Rather, the sighting, though not confirmed to have been the carolers, but highly likely, was made by a neighbor who claimed that they had heard a loud banging sound sometime around 2.30 a.m. during the morning of December 23, 1988. Upon donning a robe and heading over to the Thomas residence, the neighbor discovered the front door to be wide open a pile of old clothes littering the front porch, and Mary Thomas' body lying on the hallway rug. Thomas had suffered a heart attack sometime between two in the morning and when the neighbor had found her. Months prior, Thomas had surgically received a stent in her heart and, because of the outpouring of donations on her behalf, and her weight loss due to her health condition, decided to give much of her old clothing to a local charity for the holidays. Much of that clothing was discovered on Thomas' front porch that very morning. Eric Anderson, a 30-year-old from Liverpool, England, was declared legally dead in 2007 after being considered a missing person for seven years. In the year 2000, after not returning to work for a period of three days, Anderson's apartment was visited by local police who discovered not only the home to be vacant, but no signs of forced entry or foul play present within. Instead, investigators were only left with an empty bed, Anderson's pajamas beneath the covers, and nothing to suggest that he had fled the premises. All of Anderson's clothes and suitcases were accounted for, and a wallet containing his ID and $600 in cash were retrieved from the nightstand. Though no official connection to the phenomenon ever surfaced, Anderson's eventual obituary did describe him as a charitable man. Despite this claim, however, little evidence of such generosity was conveyed in Anderson's financial statements. Additionally, these statements never once suggested that Anderson had any children nor was paying any form of child support. Yet, in spite of this, ten children's winter garments were discovered surrounding Anderson's bed on the night the police investigated his disappearance. One of the earliest documented cases of the phenomenon, occurring during a midnight mass at the Basilica of St. Luke in North Bay, Ontario on Christmas Eve, 1895, describes a candlelit service that ended with a core rendition of Silent Night. Many of those within ceased their singing, but according to a letter written from the Basilica to a neighboring one, the heavenly hosts continued in their praises until the final word was uttered. When the voices had finished the song, many of the congregants in attendance led by candlelight, made their way outside and into the snowstorm that waited them, even those too fearful to trek beyond the warmth of the building, rejoiced as the arms of their brothers and sisters in Christ carried bundles of blankets, hand whereupon sweaters, 
and other gifts for the Lord into the sanctuary. Many of these gifts would be distributed to the needy and poor the following Christmas morning, though to this day the origins of these articles remain a mystery. Many paranormal investigators and some religious scholars have concluded that if the claims of the phenomenon should be considered truthful, the carolers are mere harbingers who, rather than offer warnings for the future, offer gratitude for the past. However, others, far more skeptical of purely goodwill beings of Yule, suggest that the carolers, if they exist at all, may also serve as vengeful Christmas time spirits. Shopping during this time of year can be a real nightmare. Trying to find the perfect gift can be a real challenge. Along with having to compete with all the other shoppers out there trying to do the same. But what happens when in the search to make someone's Christmas dreams come true? You end up uncovering a nightmare that will haunt you for the rest of your life. That's what happens to our protagonist when he opens a gift he wishes he could get returned. Our next story is called Millie Muffin Top, and it's posted by Waffle Toast. I've always hated Christmas. Not as a holiday, don't get me wrong. It's just the stress of rushing around to pick up gifts on some of the busiest days of the year. When my daughter Emily was seven years old, she was at the doll phase. My wife and I used to find it baffling how she was still into dolls and for good reason she loved the little things that Christmas. My wife was in a car accident. I wasn't myself that year. I refused to take time off work. My little girl needed comfort more than ever and I had to work up the money to give her the best gift I could afford. I realize now that I should have invested time in her, not my job. My wife's parents were willing to look after her whilst I worked, but from their cold stares I could tell that they disapproved of my overtime. I went out to the biggest toy store in town. All the boxed toys lined up in rows on shelves, taunting myself and all the other eager parents outside the shop windows. I was near the end of the queue when the doors opened, and even after I finally got inside, most of the gifts had been snaffled up from the shelves, except for the shelves near the back of the shop. I walked over, seeing toys aimed at bows, Super soakers and action figures lined the shelves, except for the far left, where five boxes marked with Millie Muffin Top and bubble text across the front. I picked one up. There was no clear plastic, so I had no way of seeing the contents of the box. The name seemed to give the impression that the toes were a copy of the popular strawberry. Shortcake toys that my daughter liked, I waltzed over the counters, bought the doll, and went home. I knocked on the door of my in-law's house and was greeted by the dull expression of my late wife's mother. We exchanged small talk before I drove Emily back home. That night, while Emily was on the couch watching TV, I went into her room and opened the box to her toes so I could place it on her bed. I carefully opened the box. Non-existent eyes greeted me. Hollow sockets where the eyes would have been. I expected the doll further, and I soon realized that the eyes were not the worst part about the doll by far. Beneath the clothing lay a bed of slowly decomposing flesh accompanied by an odor I could barely stomach. 
The doll was made from the skin of what seemed to be a small child. Crude stitching laced the sides of the doll. I threw the doll across the room. It hit the floor with a thud, much heavier than I would have expected. I came to a horrifying conclusion. There was something inside the doll. I ran downstairs to get a knife, not because of some child's play shit or anything like that, but to cut that thing open. My curiosity had gotten the better of me, and I needed to see the doll's contents. Daddy, what's wrong? Inquired my daughter in a worried tone. Nothing, sweetie. Just stay down here and watch the TV, okay? I grabbed the knife and crept back up the staircase. As I opened the door to Emily's room, the doll lay where I had left it. Thank God. I shoved the knife into the side of the doll and pulled downwards. Ripping open the side of the doll, I pulled out a small box the side of a squeaker. I shook it. Hearing multiple things moving around inside there, I found an opening and I widened it with my knife. I sat there frozen. Inside was a picture of a baby. If I had to guess, I would say she was round for months old. She lay limp on a messy floor. I clasped my hand to my mouth, seeing the red pool around the child. I removed the picture and vomited into my hands upon seeing the proof that this was not some sick joke. Two small eyeballs. They sat above the final item from the box. Some form of receipt lay under the eyes. I soon realized it was the kind of note that usually came with these kinds of dolls. It read the following. Hi, I'm Millie Muffintop. Thank you for adopting me as your new little baby girl. I promise to be the best sister ever. For our fifth and final story tonight, we are visiting some of the more well-known creatures that haunt many of the stories we spread around the dark corners of the internet. We all celebrate this time of year and that also includes the horrors that stalk our nightmares. For our final story tonight, we present to you Black-Eyed Children at Christmas, written and posted by Austin D.R. Mrs. Delphine Smithers was an 83-year-old who lived by herself save for her cat her husband had passed two years prior and her children have since grown up and left the nest. But come Christmas time, and Mrs. Smithers gets her joy whenever her grandchildren paid a visit. She thought of the looks on their faces whenever she served them Christmas cookies and other pleasantries this Christmas. She made some sweet and salty bark and kept it on the kitchen table. She found herself sitting down in her favorite chair, knitting a scarf when there came a sharp knock on the door. She jumped a bit, not expecting any visitors at the moment. Can we come in? Smithers tentatively laid the scarf on the arm of the sofa and gripped the chair. Her frail bones popped and shifted, getting up from the chair. Smithers collected her walking stick and trudge rigidly towards the front door. Another sharp knock rang out, that time more agitated than previously. I'm coming, hold on. She grasped the doorknob and turned it counterclockwise. The door creaked open. On the other end of the door were two children, a boy and a girl. The boy appeared older, presumably around 13. He wore a denim hoodie and gray pants. He was holding the hand of an eight-year-old girl who was wearing a blue dress with white lace. For whatever reason, the children had their heads bowed. Looking at their feet, the boy repeated his question. 
Can we come in? Smithers scratched her head. It was at 10 p.m. Why would these children be at her house at that time of night somehow? The bow must have realized what she was thinking. We need to borrow your phone. My cell phone battery's dead. Smithers thought more about the suddenness of having these unexpected guests. But they were children regardless. At the very least, she could grant them this one request. She nodded her head, gesturing the two children in. Smithers directed them into the living room where her cat awakened from the ruckus. When it set its eyes on the two mysterious children, the cat arched its back and hissed. Smithers walked over to silence her cat. Lex, these are our guests. Behave yourself. The cat mewed in defeat before running out of the living room and into the kitchen, the two children sat on the sofa, their eyes still hidden. Smithers went into the kitchen and pulled out the plate of sweet and salty bark. She returned to the living room and bent down to the children's eye. Levels. Care for some sweets. The boar looked up. There was a good reason as to why he was shielding his eyes. They were devoid of color or pupils. Nothing more than pitch black nothingness. Whatever he was, he assuredly was not of the earthly realm. The girl looked up as well. Her eyes matched the cold blackness of the older bull. And yet most bizarre, Smithers smiled at the children despite the hollow sockets that they call eyes. The children were speechless at first they shared a puzzled blare. The girl waved her hand in front of Smithers' face, but Smithers didn't follow the path of it. They leaned in closer, realizing that Smithers' eyes were glazed over in a thin sheet of blue. She was blind. Smithers suddenly frowned. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't care for them? Ah, uh, thank you. He took a piece of the sweet and salty bark and broke it in his hand before passing the girl a piece. Their heavy teeth ground down on the sweets. Oddness aside, the two children couldn't help but bask in the sweetness and saltiness of the snack. They indulged themselves in more of the sweets before getting up. They looked at the decorations with curiosity. On top of the fireplace on a stand was a small replica of the nativity scene. From her mental notes, she figured that the two children had stopped at the fireplace. Isn't it such a lovely display? Do you know the story of Christmas? We know about your Jesus. Our ancestors spoke a lot about him. Confused by his statement, Smithers nevertheless allowed the two children to further marvel at the Christmas decorations. The girl rustled the Christmas tree, causing the ornaments to fall on the ground. She ceased when she sensed Smithers getting upset. The two children played with the nutcrackers and listened to Christmas songs. The hours edged by slowly until a sudden Electrical search generated through the house. The two children looked at each other and back at Smithers. We have to go now. Our parents are here. Bright light shone through the windows. Outside was a spherical, smooth craft standing on three legs. A large, skinny-looking creature exited the craft and stood there at the door. The two children collected the plate of sweet and salty bark and exited through the front door. There came the sound of a large whistle, as if there were a thousand steam engines situated outside. But then a flash, the craft was gone. Smithers called out for the two children, only to be met by a great silence. She closed the door and returned to her knitting.
We hope you all have enjoyed the collection of holiday stories we presented you all with tonight. From all of us here, we hope you have a happy holidays. And we look forward to the new year and all the other horror we are able to collect for all you. Good night and sleep well, if you can, for the night holds secrets that even your nightmares dare not reveal. <laughs>